Okay, it said, it, okay, it says live, but we're in record only mode, so nobody's actually watching this live. Okay, anyway, yeah, now we're recording, so hello, anybody who watches this in the future. I am uh, Chastity White Rose, also known as Chandler Clev, and I'm here with my good friend, uh, Nathan Morday, which is also known as Papa Ortiz. Um, um, he's, a, he's a good friend, and we used to do podcasts together a lot more frequently, but, you know, life takes over, um, and, and I wanted to talk with, with him about, you know, his biopantheism philosophy and catch up on life and that sort of thing. Anyway, what's been going on over these past few years? Many things have changed, and I, I, so right from the start, Papa or Nathan, which would you prefer? Oh, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, Nathan is my pen name, my pseudonym, and that's how I, you know, how I author all my books. Um, I'll probably eventually uh, change my name legally to Nathan Mornay. It's it's a, it's a, it's an anagram, you know, um, rearranging the letters in my in my first and middle name. So that's where it comes from. But yeah. it's it's kind of like a, you know, it's an alter ego, but it's it's really just kind of like the best of who I am because it's the character in my in my fictional book, The Portal. Portal of Adam Astos. Yeah, um, and I'm glad you explained that because that's it's incredibly similar to how I am Chastity White Rose. It's sort of my my pen name, but yeah, I feel it is my yeah. true self as well. It's the name that I prefer. So yeah, but anyway, so I may interchangeably call you Nathan. Yeah, it's fine. It, whatever you feel comfortable with, because but, it's yeah. no different than me. It's no different than me getting used to calling you she. You know, yeah, or, or yeah. Chastity. yeah, it's it's I, funny. Yeah, a lot a lot has happened. So yeah, anyway, so, so Papa, um, like, okay, I have listened uh, to you in the past, listened to your videos and, and read some of your book, and I've read your blog posts over the years, you know, your biopantheism of philosophy or religion, as it's called, whatever you call it, is very good. Like, it's very amazing because it's, you know, I think of it as basically like almost like a religion for vegans. Like, uh, I'm very similar because the, uh, the, taking the concept that all is one, we're all one, we're all one life, we're all one universe, and the universe is God, and we are God. I love it. Like, I, I, I think it's great, okay? I think it's absolutely amazing. And the concept is good, but people misinterpret it. They misunderstand. It's really hard to get people to see the relevance of it. And so it, it's a good thing. Like, it's a good thing, and I think that... Ultimately, um, it's kind of the, similar to the answer that we need because we live in a world where people are making changes. People are making some positive changes, you know. People are, become, are starting to respect the lives of animals, not nearly enough, and people are becoming vegan. People, you know, racism and homophobia and stuff like that is slowly declining, forms of discrimination whether other animals or whether against other humans. You know, some, some of these things people are waking up, but here's the problem. They're doing it under a framework. They're trying to do it under the framework of their existing cultural beliefs, their existing religion. And so that's why we have people who, you know, of different religions who then have to struggle with, like, well, you know, can you be Christian and vegan? For example, people go through these struggles, and ultimately, I think people do need a new worldview. People have to have a worldview. They need to have a philosophy that encompasses, you know, the the big answers to the questions and a way of looking at the universe that is in a line with what they know in their heart is right. I feel like that's what people need, and that's why biopantheism. Is a really good thing, so I so I'm on board with you, and I want you to understand that I think that's great. But you know, personally, there is a topic, and we've talked about this before, where I really struggle, and this is this has caused me a struggle because when I was when I was raised in Christianity, this is my struggle. When I became an atheist, this was my struggle, and now whatever I am, I mean, it's still a struggle, even as I try to understand biopantheism, it's still a struggle because this sexuality topic is a very big one. 
no matter what your worldview, whatever religion you were raised in, whatever religion you embrace later in life, you know, the topic of sexuality and how that religion or philosophy deals with that topic is going to make a huge difference because, you, you know, there are people who will embrace a worldview based on what it, what it allows them to do, based on what they already want to do. There are people like that, obviously. And so we've seen, this, this is just, you know, like my observation, but we have seen a world where um, people don't like the sexual repression that is common, you know, in some Christian or Muslim communities, for example. They don't like that. And for some people, that might be a reason for them leaving. But at the same time, um, there is a tendency to, with, you know, when people give up religion, some of them, they just go off the wall. You know what I'm talking about? You know how hey, some, some can, I, can I interject before I forget? Because yeah, absolutely. you've touched, yeah, on, you you touched on so many good points, and I'm, yeah. I'm going to have trouble, you know, responding to them all unless we keep it, like, brief um, with each – subject yeah um not that i don't mind hearing you talk uh it's just so we certainly need a um a biocentric philosophy or religion that is much more holistic you mentioned that and we we definitely need something that is uh, much more all-encompassing that includes the biosphere the entire biosphere that not, that not only includes how we treat um other human beings but also how we treat animals how we treat the environment um, you know our bodies and just our relationship to the earth and there's there are many um, you know schools of thought and Eastern philosophies and some new age circles and it's it is growing exactly what you said I mean uh, I believe that human beings are evolving on an ethical and moral level um, you know gradually but it's also kind of like many starts and stops and it's kind of like you know moving forward and then taking take two steps forward you know four steps back it's that kind of thing so um, like we definitely need, I've, this is why I created Biopan, um, like something that is uh, just much more all-encompassing and holistic that, you know, uh, that embodies all the, you know, the highest principles and the highest um, ethical standards and ideals of, of all of the traditional religions and belief systems. Okay, so then, and then the next point, uh, I wish I could have <laughs> hit pause for a minute and then responded you said some other stuff about um you said some other stuff about biopan and i just wanted to briefly you know throw it out there anyone who knows me anyone who's watched our podcasts um seen the videos and, and is just familiar with my work i just wanted to give kind of a brief summary um what biopan represents um is just a highly integrated um more advanced uh and more specific form of pantheism that includes veganism it's it's a um, it's just a uh, extremely comprehensive and uh, and that sounds like I'm just bragging here, but like a well thought out and very um, um, not so much elaborate because it, it is very it's a very simple concept. But let's just say uh, just a more codified, uh, highly organized and structured um, um, uh, philosophical framework or or spiritual um, worldview or outlook that uh, that in, that embodies just like these four components, which essentially is um, pantheism, veganism, antitheism, and pantheism. So these four pre-existing uh, separate philosophies combined into one, if you look at the symbol, this Venn diagram here, uh, they represent four separate philosophies combined into one, and then what you have in the center, the thing that, that connects them all is biology. So. Uh, Biopan is essentially a biocentric philosophy. It's a more advanced form of biocentric pantheism um, that includes veganism as a as the quintessential as one of the quintessential pieces of the four components combined. When those four components combined, then you have um, sort of as a Venn diagram works. You know, you end up having um, uh, smaller subset subsets or subsections of it: ecology. Um, I'm looking at my, my diagrams right now. I have, I have these things like written everywhere on the wall, but like uh, you have activism, um, science, ethics, and ecology. Those are the smaller sort of almond-shaped. It's hard to do this. In, 
backwards, the almond-shaped ones in the middle, because when you combine these philosophies, then you have other um, sort of aspects, components that come out that, that it, it's just where the focus and emphasis then becomes about something else, and then it comes about something else. You have ritual, reason, hope, um, things like that in the smaller sections there. So it actually is a very um, – it's very strong strategic in a sense and that that sort of all evolved uh, naturally or very organically but if anyone is more interested in it of course they can visit my website um, you know it's biopan.space it's very simple uh, biopan.space you know it'll you know you can just go straight to it and it'll take you to you know to this portal and it'll explain everything and, and there's articles and stuff like that the next thing you mentioned which again I forgot but I'm trying to remember um, I'm going to get to the sexuality thing in a second, but uh, I don't know. Maybe it'll come back up, but, but like essentially, yeah, what's going on in the world right now, there's so much chaos and there's so much turmoil and there always has been, and there always will be on, to a certain extent. Um, we are evolving, but, oh, you, now I remember, you mentioned that people gravitate towards certain belief systems. Um, because it allows them to do what they want to do in terms of their sort of fulfilling their carnal lust. And then they also leave certain belief systems. They also leave these traditional belief systems behind because it's so oppressive and dogmatic and because it, it literally um, creates, you know, instills and creates and perpetuates so much guilt and fear and the threat, threat of hell and sort of the, the demonizing of, of the, the, the natural world, of the animal kingdom, um, also the idea of separateness, that you know God is above um, us and we're below and then the animals are below us. And really, you know, the Abrahamic religions um, can, be, can be a beautiful source of inspiration and, uh, and really a, medi a medium for what I would say the divine principle to speak to us. But at the same time, because they're so anachronistic, because they still contain so many um, attitudes and opinions from ages past, yeah, it, it ends up, you know, becoming anti-gay, uh, you know, continues to promote the, the, um, the suppression of free thought and inquiry and, and continues to uh, sort of, you know, just the, it, 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 it essentially sort of brings out the worst in humanity while at the same time, depending on your character and where you're already at, it can, it can, it can elevate you to to create beautiful art and and become a, a you know a really um, thoughtful, compassionate you know uh, altruistic person. So it just depends on on what you get from it. I think that's what you were mentioning. So and as I'm looking at it, I'm like everything you're saying is um, there's a level of a uh, paradox to it. You know, so people are drawn to religion because they want to feel closer to God, but then that but then their religions essentially separate them from God, separate them from, from true divinity. They separate them from nature. They separate them from themselves. They cause, you know, intense internal conflict and, and, and psychological warfare that goes on because they have idealized certain, um, certain very natural uh, elements, aspects um, of the natural world and of, of human character, of human nature itself. So when you personify lust – and and you know and greed and things like that in the concept of a devil of a, of a demon and then it becomes a magnet for everything else that you believe is evil okay and then when you start getting locked into the idea well this is this is evil and this is of the devil and this symbolism and this occult you know this kind of um occult imagery is is satanic and and so it you're essentially you're creating your own um your your own um, dimension, your own worlds, uh, based on based on these worldviews, and it's not. None of it is in balance. It's all extreme, and it all becomes something. I believe, uh, you know, um, in an overarching sense, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't benefit humanity. I, I don't I don't believe Abrahamic faiths are good for humanity at all. I believe that anything can be a medium. For God, just put God in quotes, you know, for God to speak to us and, and for inspiration, anything can become a medium for that. And yeah. and religions and religion and mythology and especially Middle Eastern religion and Eastern religions are, are incredible um sort of resources and, and, and mediums, you know, to, to communicate like ineffable truths. 
like some of the highest, you know, most most beautiful and profound thoughts and ideas um, in terms of, uh, you know, character, in terms of building character, in terms of understanding real spiritual concepts. Um, so then, so then we got to get to, you know, um, is it all about just the right thing, like what to believe? Do we just reject all of these things? And well, I would say, I would say it's better to start from scratch and literally just study biology and study nature and the natural world and, and examine your own um, human anatomy and, and, and study the cosmos and cosmology and, um, and the sciences and things like that and, and really dive into to, you know, philosophical literature. But it's almost like it's too late for that. We've all, we've all been indoctrinated. We've all been inculcated you know, in, in, the, in these traditional belief systems. So let's just, let's just start from where we are. It's kind of a huge hodgepodge. In the West, you know, we're, we're basically dominated by Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Some and some New Age influences, you know, some paganism, some some Wiccan, um, you know, Wiccan belief systems and and Druidry and stuff like that. And so, what Biopan represents is sort of drawing the best from all these sources in terms of the aesthetics, in terms of the pagan aesthetic, the Druid the Druid aesthetic of um, communion with nature, you know, honoring you know uh, uh, the, the life principle, the life force, and and celebrating the, the the solstices and the equinoxes and things like that but all of that is completely up to you however you want to uh celebrate and and you know um find you know connection and communion with with the forces and powers that, that govern our lives it's totally up to you um i i gravitate toward celtic and, and gaelic um, um symbolism and, and iconography and things like that but it's totally up to you um what we got to really get to here is um the question I think is what is reality and what is God? Like what to believe about reality and God? So that's the main thing that I believe is the question people should be asking. And of course, religions are all always there to try to fill in the gaps and give you those answers, you know, those predetermined answers that based on their dogma, based on their interpretation of, of yeah. 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 Let me, let me say mm-hmm. this for a second is that people uh, constantly think the question is does God exist? But that is not the question. The question is, what is God? Because only if you know what you're talking about can you discuss whether it exists and why it matters or not. And I yes, think totally. you, do, you can take a step back. That needs to be defined. You can't, you can't ask someone, do you believe in God? Well, the, the real question is, what is God? Like, what's your concept of God? And I'll tell you if I believe in that or not. If you mean a man in the sky sitting on a throne with testicles who, you know, is, is <laughs> mad at everybody – and and cares who you sleep with and in what position and 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 someone that you know um uh, uh condemns um you know homosexuality and lgbtq people are basically living in sin you know and and, and you need to you know the, the patri- promotes patriarchy and you have to like obey your husband and um yeah. and the idea of um of, of certain aesthetics certain aesthetics are pure certain aesthetics are evil i mean then then yeah that's that's not the God I believe in. Um, right. Although I'm, I'm extremely familiar and educated, you know, when it comes to you know scripture and Judeo-Christian, um, you know, conventional belief yeah. systems. So you could talk about the universe. You could say it's all energy and power, and it's the the secret, and the, it's all about manifesting and the law of attraction, things like that. And that gets into all the woo-woo, right? But like, yeah. uh-huh. I mean, I've recently had some extremely transformative powerful experiences where I've, I've come to understand that on a certain level if you're ready for it everything yeah. that everyone believes is true and real if they believe in it it becomes real to them and I'm not just saying oh reality it's subjective no literally I literally I'm now of the opinion okay that whatever a human being consciously puts all their intention to and believes in and has faith in that belief system, that worldview then is reinforced in their own, in their own perception, their own perception makes it real. And I'm saying we can come back to this, but what I'm saying is that's why it's so scary. That's why there's so so much conflict. That's why this really needs to be resolved like on a universal level, because we have hundreds, thousands of conflicting belief systems and everyone's at war with everyone because everyone sees the world differently. We're, we're literally, you know, you know, 7 billion people, 8 billion people, like who are all living in their own reality and, and they all have their own perception of reality. And what I'm trying to say is, oh, 
yeah, well, we know that there's an objective reality. We believe in science and stuff like that. And, you know, if we're pantheists, then we, we you know, we don't worship nature, but we, we, we revere and we honor nature and we, we see divinity in the natural world. That's, that's the, where I've come from. That's the sort of the structure and the, and the foundation. But what I'm, what I'm telling you now is, um, I'm saying that our perception, our, our power, our creative powers are actually what make the world what it is. Like we literally create the heaven or hell on this earth based on our belief systems. So it is absolutely vital and essential that we establish what we truly believe because even unconsciously our subconscious mind, um, like, like reverberates outward and we, and we literally, uh, uh, create, you know, our own belief systems are then, are then basically manifest in the world and then respond to us and we respond to them. And it's just it's like, this just cycle. Um, so I'm speaking in general terms, but let's get right. to, um, yeah. let's get to the, the question about sexuality and stuff like yeah. that. So we know that obviously in certain conservative fundamentalist evangelical circles, um, sexuality, has always been frowned upon, uh, you know, premarital, premarital sex, um, promiscuity, um, licentious behavior. Uh, it, these things have always been associated with the carnal nature, the carnal mind, the devil, temptation. Okay. And, you know, coming out of the 50s and, and, and just living in America, like we, we're still seeing, we're still feeling the consequences of that, of, of the repress, repression of sexuality, the condemnation of alternative lifestyles. Or, or you know, non uh, non traditional, non um, non binary orientations and and gender uh, identities and things. So, how could this possibly be a good thing? Like, obviously, humans run the gamut between male and female, and the the the, the spectrum is is broad, broad and wide. And I live in Portland, Oregon, so I've seen it all, man. I go to Pride every year. I don't think I went last year, but uh, and you see it all there, you know, Pride. Um, Celebration, Pride Parade, and stuff. The Pride Festival. Sometimes I'd like to see that. Yeah, yeah, you'd love it, man. Uh, woman, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so like, I, what I'm saying is, it doesn't matter. Like these things don't matter. What matters is how you treat other human beings and other life forms. What matters is, um, not what you look like, uh, not not how you identify, and not even what pronouns you use. You know, because obviously it's going to take us time to, to become more gender fluid and move away from um, heteronormative um, language and, 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 and uh, assumptions. And so, like, it's 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 so basic, man. It's like biology. Let's just let's just focus on like like what all mammals and primates need. Well, let's say mammals, birds, fish you know, crustaceans, let's say that the, the higher organisms, you know, who actually have central nervous systems and brains and can feel pain and experience trauma and suffer and, you know, have, have the, in their capacity to, uh, you know, to experience um, negative emotions and psychic pain and, and, and suffer physically, we're all the same. You know, a, a cow is a bear, is a dog, is a boy, is a man, you know, it's, it's all the same. So that's what counts. That's what matters. But the problem is spiritual beliefs get in the way, like metaphysical beliefs that people identify with and associate themselves with absolutely dictate and, and instruct their morality. And I'll say morality, not as in like necessarily, you know, good behavior, uh, being moral and whatever. No, I mean what they think morality is, what they think purity and, and righteousness is and stuff like that. And then, and you end up basically dominating, exploiting, oppressing, enslaving, um, abusing, disregarding, you know, other, other conscious beings because of these belief systems. So let's, let's bring it home. So when it comes to sexuality, Christian fundamentalism, it can be, it, it can be an edifying, uplifting thing uh, because obviously it's just, you know, too much of anything is a bad thing. Like we, we don't want to become addicted to anything. We, we, none of our desires or our passions should control us. Um, everything should be in balance. We, but we, but let's, let's just get, you know, let's get to it. So like you have other circles who, who like, um, are much more lenient and, and much more, uh, tolerant and accepting. And you have, um, gay pastors and, and gay, um, you know, gay reverends and priests and whatever. And, and so it's becoming, it's, it's evolving as well. Um, within, uh, pagan traditions, um, within sort of the earth centered religions, 
uh, Wicca and Druidism, Druidry and stuff like that, um, like it's it's completely open. It's it's basically evolved. It's at the point in these circles where there is no judgment, you know, when it comes to gender, when it comes to sexuality, there is no there's no negative feelings, and, it, and in fact, it's actually celebrated. And it's um, you know, there there are rituals and there there there's much so much pageantry to it, and it's very beautiful, and it can be a great thing. Then you've got like these. I don't know what they're called, e ecophiliacs or something, and they, they roll around in the dirt, and they, you know, they, they it becomes, then it goes too far, and, and, and then and basically they, glor they glorify all this stuff. I mean, I think I'm thinking more of a, um, this was kind of like an, uh, this, this is a form of art, like a, of a performance art where, that, I, that I saw, but I, I'm just using it as an example that like, um, when you don't, when you, when you go so far and you swing the pendulum the other direction, you can also it can also lead to problems, you know. And and so there just needs to be balance, man. There needs to be like, you know, a good understanding of, of why we have these desires. You know, the in, impulse control, delayed gratification needs to be there because, like, let's say for like Levain Satanism, you know, um, it's it's a completely selfish religion. It's basically humanism for you know, humanism. For atheists who like the aesthetic of looking like, you know, looking like vampires, that's basically Satanism. I'm sure there's there's a lot more to it. They'll say, with with occult knowledge and, and esoteric wisdom and and uh, doing certain rituals and things like that. And but they'll have naked women. They used to have naked women on their altar, and they they, they had the idea of um, drawing your attention and drawing your energy, getting the um, Getting the masculine and the feminine um, energy principles really flowing and, and like focusing, you know, on it. And because one of the most powerful things, obviously, is, is sexuality and, uh, and our attraction to the, to the opposite sex or to the same sex or whatever. So they incorporated. They actually took that and they, you know, they, um, you know, they, they sort of monopolized that. I mean, just like how I don't want to get ahead of myself here. They monopolized it. Um, in the same way that Hollywood and and basically modern fashion and stuff does today, um, yeah. and and so it can be it can become a negative thing. But at the same time, what they were trying to do, they, they're an, they're an anti-theist religion. They were trying to get away from the idea of uh, the Handmaid's Tale, you know, of 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 oppre oppressing the, the feminine. We want to we want to revel in it and glor glorify the yeah. female body. I actually watched a few episodes yeah. of that series, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So I I, walked, I haven't finished it, but I watched a few episodes of it, and oh man, it's brutal. You know. Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's that's one potential future if some kind of if some kind of world religion, um, if if, if some kind of patriarchal uh, uh, Abrahamic religion ends up taking over, basically, and it's it's terrible. It's horrible. It's really scary. It's like you're just going backwards. It's like you're going back to the Puritan, you know, and the Salem witch trials, and that's that's that that's the that's the the the, uh, the threat. So I so what I was trying to say was in Satanism, they really wanted to get away from all that and go in the opposite direction, you know. And I think on a certain level, you know, it's successful, but also if you ever go to Pride, Chandler, you would be disgusted. You actually wouldn't enjoy it because that's. That's all it is, is half-naked people, let's say male and females and everyone in between, because it's completely gender fluid. There's every Sexuality is just glorified, and there's just a lot of naked bodies and a lot of people that maybe you, did, you didn't necessarily want to see naked. And, you know, so it's like – it's like, and that's fine. I, I, they, I feel like they've earned that, you know. It was a hard-won right. fight. So yeah, well, I totally celebrate sexuality, like on every, yeah. every level, as long as it's consensual, as long as it's not done with children, people that are under the age of consent, as long as it doesn't involve other animals, you know, who in my mind are like children, you know, um, then you can do whatever you want. I, I, I don't care. And I would say, well, as long as you're not hurting yourself, but some people like, you know, sadomasochism and stuff. So, uh, so what I'm trying to say is these are like, you know, the different polarities and the different expressions of it. Um, if you want to make it, if you want to make this more uh, specific and structured, name a religion, and I'll tell you their view on sexuality, if that helps. Well, yeah. Well, but first, let me say something here. See, here's here's the thing about it: is I will be the first to admit that there is great power 
over the human psyche in sexuality. There is power in it. And people use that power. It is it is a power that is used to advertise products, to you know, commercial, try to sell people things and convince them they need it by by you know affecting their brain with their the sexual sells. Yeah, sex yeah, sells. Yeah, 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 people as people say, sex sells. And it's used to sell religions. It's used to sell products that companies are trying to sell. It even PETA uses sexuality in a way. Totally. And, and I've never understood that. I've never understood that or agree with that, except that it just grabs people's attention. But I don't understand how that right. how that, how that yeah. changes humans are yeah. educated about the animal. Exactly. Holiday. And and here here's the thing about it, Paul. So, and I think you would probably agree with me on what I'm about to say here is my my problem with PETA using uh, sexuality to to get people's attention in order to bait and switch them into a message about veganism and and all that is because it has this unfortunate effect of putting the focus on humans again it starts getting the focus on humans and what they're doing rather you could have a you could have a half naked girl covered in blood and she's like in a cage and that could be somebody's fantasy right there, and they're not exactly. thinking about it. Be, they're not yeah, thinking about you know minks, minks being anally electrocuted or or um, you know pig sows that are that are being artificially inseminated and enslaved in the in the furrowing crates. That's not what they're thinking about. They're just seeing what's right in front of them. You know, a half naked yeah, girl. Right. If I was walking down the street and I saw that, I would say, you know, more power to you. But like. I can't help it. I'm going to be staring at the at the hot chick covered exactly. in blood. Exactly, and they're not going to receive the message. So my so my argument against it is that it's not actually all that effective, and it really more it just exploits humans and adds more problems. So well, I think a, it's, that's a, it's a slippery slope because you can't necessarily say it's exploiting humans because these because women and and people are 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 doing this of their own volition. They're choosing to do well, it. Think, you, and know, you got a, you got a feminist. But, but but what I'm saying is, you know, it has it, it's not going to have the desired effect, and I think it's 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 just horribly misguided. There's a strain there's a strain of feminism, fourth wave feminism, whatever that actually that sex workers are glorified, and it's kind of like they're taking back their power. And as long as if they do, you know, OnlyFans, and um and and they're basically like you know webcam uh, strippers and or just whatever, you know, if, if um whatever even if they're like um uh, even if they're prostitutes at this point there is a mentality that's like well as long as she she or he or whoever is choosing to do it that's okay because you know that's um that, that's empowering but in my mind it's like but it's also disempowering to every other woman out there who ends up being objectified exactly. uh, because all it's doing is perpetuating you know the um uh, like 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 an, an unhealthy or a um an, an unbalanced over glorification or fixation on the external on the fem on the female yeah. figure on the, and, on the male figure whatever on the yeah. on the on the yeah. externals yeah and, on the, on, and, and, and on the physical the physical experience yes, the exactly I, I believe in sensuality I I absolutely think sensuality and sex are a beautiful thing I'm a, and I'm, a, I'm an extremely I'm an extremely sexual and sensual person myself, and and but it's all about the context. And basically, when you watch strippers, when you when you watch porn, when you see uh, women and women and men or any anyone in between um, doing highly erotic, intensely graphic, um, you know, sexual acts, it's extremely exciting. You're you're focused and fixating on it. All your energy is is on the visuals and on the and I'll tell you honestly as a man like on imagining what they're experiencing on the pleasure aspect of it which again I think what's happening is we are they are let me let me let me say this home let me get this out they are what what people have done in terms of consumerism and what what people do in 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 whatever institution that's doing this they are monopolizing on natural human urges, they are they're monopolizing human pleasure. They're 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 creating like a feedback loop where it becomes a drug, and you're basically giving people exactly what we all desire, but you're you're cranking it up like cranking up the intensity aspect of it 
so that it's like sensory overload. So you become desensitized to it. You become yeah. de- you become so, and you, so you need more and more, you know, more perverse and more extreme forms of sexuality um, to, to, to get that same pleasure to get, you know, or, or, or you just become a habitual, you just, you just use it habitually. So all I'm saying is you're taking something that is beautiful and, and it is pure and it is natural and it is healthy and you're, and you're putting it in a box and you're selling it and, and you know, and you're making money off of it because it does give pleasure because it is a beautiful thing. And so that's where, that's what I'm against. And so if you choose to do that, if you're a sex worker, I'm not, I'm not condemning anyone or, or telling people what they can and can't do with their bodies. What I'm saying is you're becoming, you know, some pervert out there, you know, someone who's fetishizing you, like, you don't, you're, you're not caring. I mean, it's just selfish. You're not caring about the impact that it has. You know, you're, you're literally glorifying and exploiting yourself. You know, you're, you're, you're causing the, 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 what sexuality is in our, in our culture um, you're just, you're just exemplifying it. You know, you're just kind of, yeah. like kind of adding to the problem. And, and, and actually if people walked around topless and wore less clothes, I think we would have less of a problem with rape, ironically, because in yeah. Europe and stuff like that on beaches where it's no big deal. But the, the thing is you're, you're simultaneously like, like amplifying the way that the women dress. And, and I, I'm not saying anything about I'm saying this is our culture that women are just like men. Men are just like women and everyone in between is we just want to feel attracted. We want to feel loved. We want acceptance. We want validation. And so we want to look our best. We want to, we're very, so extremely self-conscious. We want to look pretty. We want people to like us for who we are, but we also are extremely superficial and all caught up in externals. So it's just, it, it just adds to all of it. And I don't think any of it is healthy. Because, wow. because it's not about – because it, it basically takes the focus off of the fact that that's a human being, that, you're, that your feelings like are natural and they're there for a reason, yeah. and you just, you're just separating it from the rest yeah. of the process. Yeah. You're, separating, you're cool. separating the body from the person. You know, right. that's, yeah. it that, that's just it. And here's the thing about Apostle is it has a very bizarre effect too because – Here's the deal. People are exposed to that. They have sexuality forced on them. It's in everywhere. They can't escape TV, movies, commercials, everywhere they go. They, they're seeing sexuality and everything and they, and they it's embedded in everything. So it's hard to escape, but it's lost its power. Whatever power it had, it's losing its power because like you said, people have become desensitized. And so we see all this extreme crazy stuff. But first of all, I have a hard time believing that there ever was such a healthy sexuality. I have a hard time believing that. Why? Because that's not what I see. Because the if that look, if there is such a thing as a healthy sexuality, that is something that happens with consenting adults. And I'm not there to see that. That's between them. Okay, Chandler, Chandler, of course there's such a thing as healthy sexuality. Absolutely, of course. You said I think you said something. It's lost its power. I think what you meant is it's lost its purity. Like it's it's become something. It's become trivialized. It's become something that's over glorified. Is that what you mean? That it, it it's become more powerful, but right. it's lost oh, its yeah. it's lost yeah. its true meaning. It's lost yeah, its true meaning. Yeah, it's lost its meaning. That's more close yeah. to what I what I mean meaning about it. And see, of course, look, of course, I'm not going to have seen an example of healthy sexuality. Obviously, I'm the only virgin on this podcast that we're doing right now. So that- I honestly think, I honestly think, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I honestly think you have had a lifetime of being, of being exposed to everything that could possibly go wrong with sex. And mm-hmm. imagine the reverse and having a lifetime of experiencing you know, lovemaking and experiencing pleasure and experiencing uh, intimacy and sensuality with another person and seeing good examples of it in your parents and seeing good examples of it in your friends and actually understanding the, 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 the beauty and the miraculous transformative power of it. Like we're talking about the, the, the activity that creates life. Like, like if life is the most important thing in biopan, like, like biology and honoring life, and, and you're pro-life, like think about how paradoxical it is. 
you know, your your mentality, your attitude. I believe it's all it, it's all it all stems from trauma. It all stems from the experiences you've had, the negative experiences you've had. If all I ever had was bad experiences with, I don't know, chocolate with with candy bars. I have horrible allergic reactions to it. Uh, uh, my best friend choked on a you know on a chocolate bar, died from um, <laughs> anaphylactic shock. Um, my my uh, my aunt was killed in a chocolate factory. Uh, I saw someone, you know, like no, no, think about it. So I, I saw um, I I saw uh, I, I was exposed to some pornography where they're just rolling around in chocolate and it told at a young age like I was like you know nine years old and it traumatized me. Okay, well then you know what? Hey Ch hey Chandler, I'm gonna eat a piece of chocolate bar. You want some? You're gonna be like, get away from me, get away, get away. And, and, I'm and like, that is oh, Dude, that is exactly what I look like every time you've mentioned sex in the past, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so, so you telling me that's healthy? That's not healthy. That's a response. That's a reaction to trauma. You have a phobia. That's yeah. not an ethical standard. So I want to clear this up, though. Hold on. Well, two things. The chocolate I would offer would be dairy-free, first of all. It wouldn't have cow's milk in it. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be stealing from the mother cows to make our food because we can do that using every other kind of you know plant-based milk. But right. um, the other thing I wanted to say is – that's not the same thing as human reproduction. It it's what it's the act that creates human reproduction, okay? Procreation, and um, it's what allows humans to have children to replicate themselves. But that's a separate. Even though they even though they're the same subject, okay? I'm I'm sterilized. I got a vasectomy in my early twenties. Oh. Okay, people can use condoms. People can use birth control. People can use prophylactics, and and they can take steps and measures. Um, to not reproduce. We're both antinatalists. We're both antinatalists. So um, obviously yeah. we're against human reproduction because we, we, we don't believe that this world is a suitable place to raise children. We care about the suffering of animals and humans. We don't, we don't ever think we'll be a good enough, good enough parents for, for myriad of reasons, all the same reasons antinatalists don't want to have children. And we don't, yeah. we don't, we don't believe in the pronatalist sentiment. Okay. That's completely removed okay, from sensuality and sexuality. Because if two consenting adults, okay, are enjoying each other and, and consummating their love and experiencing romance and passion, okay, and, and pleasure, and they're, and they're basically loving each other in a physical way, and they're, and they're basically like, um, you, know, you, you know, experiencing intimacy, like, uh, like allowing themselves to feel what our bodies are capable of feeling, how could that on any level be wrong? It's not wrong, Chandler. It's yeah. only that you, you've never seen a good example of that. You've never seen, I don't know, softcore porn or romantic sex or or you've never seen couples who are in love who just can't get enough of each other and, and they have no intention of having children and they're, and no one's raping the other person. There's no yeah. there's no yeah. force listen, listen. sexuality. Okay. So it's different. Yeah. Well, listen, Paul, here's for a sake of an example, okay? So I came across, uh, you know, Quora, that site where people ask questions, you know, Quora, that site, you've been across there. Well, okay, so um, there was a guy who was sharing his experience on there. Um, he had he had pain, just like I had pain a lot for a long time. He couldn't find a solution. He had to have his testicles removed, okay? But that guy, he can have sex with his wife by taking shots of testosterone. So can or can't? What? He can't. He can? can because oh, yeah. he takes an injection of testosterone so that he can get an erection. Okay. He can, he can. So that is that is an example of a case where someone can do a sexual act, but there is no possibility whatsoever because there's not even testicles. There's no source of sperm. So it's going so in that sort of a scenario as just the ideal example. Somebody can have sex, but. Even well, but Chandler, but Chandler, that's you just get sterilized. It's the easiest thing is to get a vasectomy as a male, or uh, or a hysterectomy, or get your tubes tied. I mean, so it happens all the time. Right, so, like, right. like, like I, I know. I'm just, I'm yeah. just stating that this is. So listen, I'm just stating that this is like the ideal example. You know, the, the, just an ideal. But every, but every smart person I know, who maybe had one child and then they stopped, that that they've done that. Like that's what every intelligent person I know, who's in a relationship. They either they sterilize themselves or they use birth control. So like you're talking about like 
Right. Like seventy five percent of the population. I mean, I mean, I don't know the numbers. Maybe right. we're talking about like but, 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 yeah, I know, I know, I know, but can, but can you can you hush on the details like that because I'm trying to make a point here. I'm oh, going sorry, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. I'm, Go ahead. I'm, just, I'm just I'm just saying that that's an example I read about that that obviously that and other things, of course, as you mentioned, where people can have sexuality, even straight sexuality, and yet it doesn't result in procreation. And so when it comes to things like that, I don't have ill feelings towards that because I have, let me tell you, I have healed a lot of things in my life. I have, what? Come what? Lot, I have healed from a lot of things in my life. I've come a long way from where I was. And so I have, I now, my concerns about sexuality are twofold in that First of all, as an antinatalist, obviously I don't want people to be doing things that I know will result in procreation because that causes problems. And, and you and I agree on that point. The, yeah, other yeah. Thing that, the other thing that I don't want is I don't want people, um, I don't want people shamed because they don't want to have sex. And, and that, that kind of thing yeah. happened to yeah. me. It's so happened asexual. To me. People on the yeah, asexual yeah. side. Yeah, people who are who choose to be celibate or, or asexual and not interested, they should not have people harassing them and trying to talk them into doing what they don't want to do. I agree. No so, one should talk anybody into doing anything they don't want to do. I mean, exactly. you're, that's, that's a violation of your own rights. You know, of your exactly. Own, and I think we have, a, we have a culture where people have completely think that sex is such such an important thing that they don't care about consent anymore. And so we need to we so things need to be toned down to a thing where people um, they recognize the um, the power that sexuality is, and it, I think people should be free to pursue the ideal sexuality that you that you mentioned. Uh, it, that I may not still believe it myself, okay, but I'm just saying that people should be free to to search for that. Um, if there is a healthy thing, but um, people need to be aware that you know of the of concerns about you know they need to be con concerned about the risk of procreation and they need to take steps to mitigate that to do something about that because that's a reality that we have to deal with in some cases and obviously. Um, for example, when it comes to homosexual things, for example, obviously whether people sterilize or not, that doesn't result in procreation. And so as a result, whenever, what, I know this is weird, okay? I know this is going to sound like crazy, but whenever I find out somebody is gay, I have this feeling of relief. Like relief? Like, relief? Yeah. Real, really, real quick, I, Taylor, Taylor, I just want to say your audio is, is kind of bad. It's hard to hear you. There's like an, like your audio is kind of low and also... Um, the huh. echo in your house, it's hard to hear. This It's like the quality is just poor. So I can't always understand when you talk sometimes. Yeah, so sorry. Maybe, talk, maybe speak into the microphone more. I don't know. Yeah, I'm a little bit far away from it. Can you hear me when I'm closer to it? It's just the echo in the room. But, um, yeah. That's yeah, that's, that's too bad. I'm doing the best I can. I wanted, to, I wanted to, you know, go off of those points. Like, I'm going to start writing notes so I can remember. Um. Sure. Well, first of all, like my original point was I felt like you were just saying it like this is one isolated incident. This is such a rarity. And I'm just like, no, that's most smart people. They, they just choose not to have children and they still enjoy sex. And then the other thing, like I'm saying, it's not a rare thing. Like that's that's the, the norm. I absolutely agree. Uh, okay, okay, here, two things I'm remembering now. What we're dealing with is a carryover from a patriarchal society – who was they were who were all about promoting large families, you know? In the old days, like your children were your legacy. You needed people to take care of you, carry on the family name, carry on the business, that kind of stuff. Um, so we're still kind of suffering from the residual effects of that, especially like the 1950s and stuff, where you know big families. It wasn't even questioned. It was just the um, you know it was it was the, the nuclear family. And, and just kind of promoting those traditional those traditional values and and uh, those traditional norms. So what I'm saying is like it, it's not just it's not just that um, that people are shame are shaming people or or harassing or, or 
you know, um, interrogating people who are asexual, it's like it goes all the way back to like in high school, where it's glorified and it's like prom and who, you know, who's your first date and oh you're seeing someone like kids basically like pretend to be adults before they're adults, and and it's promoted. Why do we sell baby dolls to little girls? Like why why are dolls the thing? Why don't they why don't they just sell toys that promote creativity and, and yeah. help them learn science and biology and music and art and philosophy. Like instead it's like the promotion of the family. It's part of the society to continuously perpetuate um, yeah. uh, large families and breed and multiply. So I'm absolutely against that. I agree with you. Right. And so, and, and no one should be you know harassed or ridiculed for being asexual or for not being sexually active. And no one should be as a, and as a child, in shows, in movies, in cartoons, everything, you, you just have a, a, a mainstream pro-natalist sentiment that just runs through everything. And so being vegan, being pantheist is hard enough. Being vegan is hard enough. But then being pantheist, vegan, anti-natalist is like, you know, double, triple whammy. Like everybody's mad at you. Nobody understands you. You're against yeah. everyone. Because basically exactly. everyone's against you. Because basically it's like, what? Like you, like little kids, children are, are basically from a young age, they're being indoctrinated and inculcated right. in a society that is promoting uh, human reproduction and, and exactly. family and relationship yeah. and sexuality. And then as you get older and as a teenager, as, a, as a, um, an adolescent, you know, like essentially you're just bombarded with sexuality. And so of course people are having sex before they're ready. Of course um, people are humans are raping other humans and people are um are just engaging in all kinds of irresponsible behavior and unwanted pregnancies and exactly. abortion and rape and all this kind of stuff. So it's the it's the excessive promotion of human reproduction and sexuality out of context. That's the point. That's the problem. I'm saying there's nothing wrong with sexuality. In an ideal world there'd be nothing wrong with human reproduction. But what the problem is, everything is out of context. So, like, it's just like the chocolate, you know, the chocolate analogy. Like, there's yeah. nothing wrong with eating chocolate. Actually, that's a perfect analogy. As long as it doesn't have cow's milk in it. it as it, long it as a very funny are, example, too. As long as your I teeth aren't really walk out the chocolate factory, you know? As long as your teeth aren't rotting out. As long as your teeth aren't rotting out. As long as you don't have diabetes and it's going to give you a sugar high and then crash and go into, you know, hypoglycemic <laughs> shock or something. As long as you um aren't allergic to the chocolate, as long as there's no suffering involved, there's no cow's milk involved, then actually it's a great example because the cocoa, you know, the, the um you, you know that the, the way that it's farmed and stuff with like Nestle, there's a lot of um uh, human oppression involved in the in the production of, of chocolate. So uh, chocolate itself by itself is not bad. But if you're allergic to it, if it if it makes you sick, if it's got cow's milk in it, um you know, if you're eating too much of it, if it becomes an addiction, if it becomes an addiction, it's something that controls you, and you're 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 binge eating, and you're using it, um, you know, for pleasure, and it and it becomes, you know, um, your comfort eating, then chocolate can be just as bad as anything else. So what I'm trying to say to you is, sex is chocolate, man. <laughs> it's the same thing, like sexual chocolate. <laughs> Eddie Murphy. That's maybe, cool. maybe that should be the title of this video. <laughs> sexual chocolate. You should watch – there's a Johnny Depp movie, and it's all about chocolate. It's called Chocolat, and it's a really cool film. Um, oh, oh, Johnny Depp. Oh, I know yeah, that yeah. guy. He, he played the Mad Hatter in those Alice in Wonderland movies. <laughs> yeah, Johnny Depp is, is dealing with some shit. He's being canceled because his ex you know, accused him of all this stuff. But then it turns out she was the one that was really abusive. Yeah, it's crazy. Marilyn Manson's oh. going through the same thing. Um, okay, so anyway, my point is you have an aversion. You have an aversion to sex and sexuality and sensuality and romance and basically physical love because every example you've ever seen has been traumatizing to you. It's been traumatic. It's been negative. It's been the worst possible example, whether it's molestation and sodomy and unwanted pregnancies or rape or abortion or um, – even probably uncomfortable, you know, forced sexual encounters in your own life. So what do you expect? Of course you think it's a bad thing. But what I'm trying to tell you is it's not a bad thing 
it's it's all about context. It's all about who's doing what with who. So it kind of sounds like I'm back to the fundamentalist Christianity thing, like God cares about who you do what with with who. Well, I just there's a few parameters here, okay? As long as it's con among consenting adults, people who, who – because it's, it's an extremely powerful thing, okay, to, to bond with another human being or multiple human beings in polyamorous relationships. It's an extremely powerful thing. I think it should be taken seriously. I don't necessarily believe in casual sex, but, you know, that's, that's up to other people because I'm a, I'm a deeper, more emotional, philosophical, thoughtful, intellectual person, so I can't just have casual sex with people because I'm going to end up getting attached. So what I'm saying is as long as it's consensual among adults, it doesn't involve children, it doesn't involve animals. I would say as long as it doesn't involve feces, but you know, but that's that's a health aspect, you know, like that that like yeah. you know, bacteria yeah. make you sick or whatever. Yeah, like, like, everything like else work. Yeah, like just a little I was bit gonna say everything else goes. Everything yeah. else in my mind is 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 perfectly acceptable, except for the oh, I and I forgot. As long as it doesn't involve incest. So in ancient times, brothers and sisters married, and their their mothers and father, their mothers and daughters. Oh, sorry, fathers and daughters had sex, and brothers and sisters had sex when the human population was small, and and there weren't as many genetic defects involved. Now, obviously, there's going to be biological consequences, and there's going to be emotional consequences because of the kind of the way our society is structured, because there's so many people. So. As long as it doesn't involve children, as long as it doesn't involve non-human animals, as long as it doesn't involve uh, family members, okay? And I would say just biologically for health reasons, as long as it doesn't involve feces, you can do whatever you want. Now, where you do it, you know, if, if other people are witness to it, things like that, if it's being used for money, that's where it gets gray, the gray area, and that's when you, you know, the, each kind of situation has to be addressed individually. But other than yeah. that, other than that, I think it's all positive. I think it's, I think it's a beautiful yeah. thing. I, I well, wish you had a different outlook on it because well, it really see, is. Like, 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 here's here's an example. Okay, look. Okay, here's just how I feel. Okay, I understand your points, but here's how I feel. Okay, I feel that sex, uh, sexuality in general, is like a gun. It's like a gun, and here's why, because it is too powerful. It, it is something so powerful that humanity should, and even the other animals, should not have been trusted with something that powerful. I feel like it should not be part of, I feel like it should not be part of the biological organism, part of like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so here's here's how I'm feeling. Okay, this, I'm just I'm just opening my heart. I get it. I, I I understand. I feel like the universe or God uh, was wrong. Was wrong. <laughs> let's talk about that. that. Let's let's talk about that. I really love talking about something that powerful that can be misused to that extent. That's what I'm saying. Hey Chandler, how many people have drowned in the last ten thousand years in water? Are we counting the flood of Noah? <laughs> how many people? How many people have suffocated or died of, uh, let's say, of exposure to um, to the elements, to uh, extreme temperatures, or to the sun? You know, heat exhaustion. How many people have 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 gotten killed in car accidents? Cars, automobiles are pretty powerful things. I mean, extremely powerful. How many train accidents? How many plane accidents? How many people have accidentally harmed themselves, uh, have been electrocuted? Every single one of these things is a powerful force of nature because it originally everything comes from nature, and so it's an extension of nature, and yet it can be used for good or for evil. Water is necessary, essential for life, but too much of it will kill you. The sunlight yeah. is a yeah, yeah. I get, all yeah, life. I get what you're saying. It, and don't think I haven't had the same conversation with a lot of different people, okay? But, like, let, let me take, for example, there is a difference between, like, like let, me, let me bring this back to the difference between a gun and a knife, for example. A gun and a knife both can be used to kill someone, for example. There's no doubt about that. But a knife also has another use. Yeah, it's a utilitarian. Chop up your vegetables, uh, repair your yeah. meal, that yeah. kind of thing. You know, it can it can be used to 
to cut a, a you know cut a rope that's trapping someone. It, you know, Chandler, so a gun, Chandler, a gun, a gun can be used to protect someone from harm. A gun can be not used, but the the, the brandishing of a gun can protect an entire family from being raped and killed by by someone else by an assailant. Do you understand? It's 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 all in how it's used. It can be used as a shield. It can be used as an assassination tool. It can be used for protection, or it can be used for murder. It can be used if you have to survive and hunt and kill animals to to to, to you know sustain yourself. I'm I'm talking about in the past, or maybe right, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, look, so, look, look, let's just say for the sake of example, to to keep it say for the sake of example, I agree with you, okay, but. Here's what I'm saying. Yes, that's the world we live in. But at the same time, I am saying that a world where the gun had never been invented and there was no such thing as the concept of a gun, meaning nobody had guns because there was no such thing invented, I still think that is a better world. And likewise, I'm saying something similar about sexuality because I think there should have been something different than sexuality. I can, I can, I can, I can fantasize and theorize and hypothesize with you, and I would probably agree with you on some level. Um, but at the same time, there's nothing you can do about it. It literally is the way it is. So it's not even it, it's 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 an exercise in futility to say I but, wish there was. Listen to me, listen to me, Papa. This is important. I know that fantasizing about it doesn't change the world that we live in, but there is a point to all this. There's a reason. It's not an exercise in futility because an exploration of this topic and the reason I'm bringing this up isn't just to get you to agree with me on a hypothetical. That's not what I'm doing. The point is that this view, my belief that there is a different way that the universe, life, God should have done things. This is something that I have always wrestled with, and I know I'm not the only one. I know I'm not the only one who has wrestled with this thing. And whether you're a Christian, Muslim, Jew, uh, or even a pantheist, you have, or whatever, you have to think, well, why does the universe, or why does uh, Yahweh, Allah, or God, whatever, why would God do that? Why? Yeah, let, let, me, let me tell you, let me tell you, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you right now, okay? I wrestle with the same thing when it comes to the subject of suffering, of physical pain, okay? Yeah. The exact same way you feel about sex, I feel about physical pain. In the last few weeks, in the last two months, I have a completely different perspective on the human condition and on suffering and on pain, okay? Were it not for my own scars, my own bodily scars, and my own, my own suffering, I would have probably lost my mind. And I would be trapped in some kind of psychosis right now. Okay, I, I I understand intimately now why suffering is necessary. Even if if I could have my way, I could go back. I would say just just give us the sensation to avoid harm without feeling the prolonged um, intensive experience. Of physical pain. Why are our eyeballs so sensitive? Shouldn't they be made out of plexiglass or plastic or something? Like it's, it does, makes no sense. Why? Why does does air and food go down the same you know down the same hole? Exactly. Where we can choke when we have a trachea and an esophagus, and they're basically connected, and you can choke so easily. It makes no sense. Okay, what I'm trying to tell you is, this is the way that nature has unfolded and embedded within all living organisms the the penchant and the inclination to reproduce in order to create maximum biodiversity okay let's just for lack of a better word let's say god nature the universe um made sex pleasurable for for creatures that like us for other creatures i mean a, a praying mantis gets its head eaten off sometimes you know, if it's if it's lucky, it escapes with its life. But the whole point is to reproduce and reproduce and reproduce and continue to reproduce and continue to proliferate and continue to proliferate so that every single experience can be experienced as nature, God, branches out and becomes more and more conscious, more and more sentient and evolved. 
the pleasure associated with sex is no different than than the oxytocin that is in a woman's breast milk um, that that keeps the child coming back, or um, or the uh, the opiate that's in um, the casomorphine that's in cow's milk that causes the calf to continue nursing. Okay, it's there for a reason. It's a very practical um, um, sort of utilitarian thing that that's built in to the system in order for for organisms to unite and procreate okay yeah. now for I higher evolved well, no. i'm trying to get to a point but go ahead yeah i have to use the restroom i'll be i'll be right oh, back okay sure so i'll just keep talking then <laughs> yeah totally no i'm just i'm joking <clears throat> In Chandler's next life, he's going to be a celibate, magical flying unicorn in a world where uh, horses and ponies just reproduce by blowing bubbles, and they're never going to they're never going to they're never going to mount each other or or experience pleasure on a physical level. It's just going to be like like candy, you want to, you want to have a child? Okay, let's mix these two gumdrops together, and then we're gonna have poof, and it's no sex involved. Hey, Papa, that sounds that sounds about right. That really does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So listen, look, I look, I understand biology. I understand the way things are and the pleasure sensations <laughs> also. I get that. That is what caused uh, procreation to happen at the rate it is. That, and I get that that's literally why we're alive today. I get that. I get that our existence is because of that. However, what, I, what I'm what i saying is that my, is it, my, you know, I'm saying my fundamental problem with, and I think this is, this is a barrier to me accepting any kind of religion, even pantheism, even biopantheism, yeah, yeah. I feel like a personal yeah. barrier to me. Oh, there needs to, there needs to be a religion that doesn't that doesn't promote uh, pleasure on any level, like that doesn't promote physical pleasure between between two humans or two, two or more humans. Yeah. You want a religion that is completely celibate, where we experience pleasure maybe psychologically or emotionally without um, without rubbing our genitals together, the way you, the way you put it. Without without physical contact. Well, actually, almost, but not exactly quite. Here's what I here's what I'm saying. So this this is I know this is weird, but I believe that a if okay, first of all, procreation should only be happening in an ideal world where there is no suffering. I agree. Yeah, but it, let's say in this ideal world, procreation happens not by rubbing of genitals and not by having, you know, people with different sex bodies rubbing genitals. And uh, instead it would be done by an act of true love by people who really do love each other. And that's not what sex is because people who hate each other can still use each other and just fuck each other over literally and have sex, but not love. And what I'm saying is in this ideal world that I imagine, which I know is not the world of uh, where there it where there is an act of love that is not like sex, but even be, it's better because it's incorruptible. It's it's always pure. It can't. But nothing, be. but nothing is incorruptible, and and because because something can be misused, or misappropriated, or exploited, doesn't mean that that thing shouldn't exist. It means that's the reason that thing exists is to learn. Um, to the, uh, learn to experience it in a healthy and, and balanced way. That's the entire purpose of existence, Chandler, is so that we can learn what corruption is, what morality is, so we can actually grow and evolve and become, you know, higher, more altruistic, compassionate, more loving, more more considerate, um, you know, uh, uh, 
creatures, uh, uh, life forms, organisms. That's the entire point. Just because something has the capacity to be misused or can be manipulated or exploited, and as it, powerful, you know, whatever, whether it's a powerful thing or whether it's a trivial thing, doesn't mean that that thing shouldn't exist or that nature made a mistake. Like, nature doesn't make mistakes. Everything nature does actually has a purpose and a reason. Even the suffering, the, the untold amounts of suffering in nature allows, like, like for this, you know, this explosion of, of biodiversity and, and tenacity to, to make individuals and organisms, um, you know, uh, better adapted, more suited to their environment, more intelligent, more kind, more, just more precise and, 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 um, and, and more highly evolved. And so what you're talking about, what I want to say is if we talk about it in the, in the terms that you talk, that you speak of it, on, 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 a spe on specific on a specific level you're, you're fixating on a, on a component of, of nature or of existence and so when you do that when you fixate on a component of existence and you take it out of context with the rest of creation I want to say creation because that's a traditional the rest of existence and the rest of the creative process that's taking place on this planet. when you take anything out of context and you isolate it, you can make it into anything you want. You can make it into an idol, or you can make it into a, you know, a horrific, condemning thing. And that's what you've done. What I'm trying to say is, your, your um, your misunderstanding. That's the nicest way I can put it. Your misunderstanding, your false perception, comes from the fact that you have broken the first rule of pantheism. You have taken something and isolated it and put it into a box by itself, without understanding that it's part of a larger a part of a larger experience that it has purpose beyond just beyond just the negative consequences that you yourself have experienced so that's why i use the example of water or chocolate or sunlight all these things can kill you okay this computer can kill me okay like like um marijuana can eventually kill you and make you stupid if that's all you do all day long like like yeah. on a certain level you'll basically you know just devolve You'll rot. At the, at the, on the other on the other aspect, you know, you can eat edibles, and basically see God. So it's all about it's all about the context, and it's all about how it's how it's used or misused, and it's also about not isolating something to make it all good or all bad. Nothing is all good, and nothing is all bad, Chandler. Nothing. There is no ideal perfect state. There's always levels and levels and levels to reach. Because when you get when you if you stagnate and you think that you've reached a utopia or a certain level, um, then then you failed. Because life and nature is always in the process of creating new experiences. It seeks novelty. It wants to see what's around the corner. It wants to explore itself. Do you understand? So, 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 so you're basically telling me is I failed pantheism, right? No, no. I'm saying <laughs> I'm saying you're not. A, you, I'm saying you're not understanding. How beautiful sex can be! How beautiful, uh, pa you know, and and lovemaking and sensuality can be. I'm saying you need an out of body experience where you where you are in a loving relationship, committed relationship, whatever, and and you you can experience what millions of other people have have experienced throughout history, what billions of people experienced throughout history, like like literally. You're only looking at one component. You're only looking at one aspect of something that can be whatever you make it into. That's what I'm trying to say. It is whatever you make it into. Like there are people who think that the technology is evil. This, this medium that we're using right now, now, and I could totally agree with that. If I looked at from their perspective, I say, look at all the pornography. Look at Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and TikTok. Oh my God, look at TikTok. It's just it's glorifying all these teenagers are just. They're acting like sluts, and all they want to do is like, you know, it's just show off their bodies, and it's and it's it's disgusting. And it's basically making these porn stars, you know, children are becoming porn stars through TikTok. But you know what? You know what else? TikTok can be used for vegan activism, and TikTok can be used to promote messages of healing and health and and educate people. Okay, and this medium right now can be used to communicate some of the most powerful and profound messages imaginable. So it's all about how it's used in the context. 
And that's all I'm trying to say is I'm not yeah, asking, I'm not trying to get you to change your mind. I'm just trying to get you to understand the logic or the illogic, how irrational it is yeah. to take yeah. one thing yeah. out of existence yeah. and say, this see, is all bad. Deal, Listen, this is why we're having this talk. You see, this is why we're having this talk. Okay. Because like, like I've said before now, in, in general, I don't talk about, um, I don't talk about other people specifically when I'm doing podcasts, but I, I do want to mention Monique. Okay. I really do. I, because, I, because I just want to mention that, you know, I've done my podcast with her in the past. We had our solo vegan voice podcast. And here's the key issue is that, um, look, I love Monique. Monique's a valuable friend. And I, and I love the fact that she agrees with me. I love the fact that we do this podcast. That's great. However, at the same time, I value uh, this time with you because you are someone with a different worldview than me. So I appreciate, I respect that you come from a different perspective and we make ourselves stronger when we talk with those who see things differently or disagree with us. That's just it. And so what I'm telling you is that I'm trying to learn and I'm trying to grow here in this area. That's what I'm saying. That's why we're having this talk. That's, that's commendable. I said that earlier to you on the phone. I said it's incredibly commendable. I can I can feel that you want to expand your understanding and grow in this area. And you see that it's a – and that means you're, you are evolving. Um, the fact that you're not just like – you know, like <laughs> – you, you, uh, you react like a cat, um, you know. That's, yeah. Um, that is like a squirt bottle. You know, I come around with the little squirt with the squirt bottle and you're like, <sighs> like you think it's evil and it's killing you. And it's like, anyway, I'm saying, okay, let's, let's get, let's get deep for a minute. Okay. Okay. Here's what it comes down to anything or any experience that you have, any object, any symbol um, any, any particle, any, any bit of, 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 you know, of matter combined into something can become like your worst nightmare. It can become literally the thing you fear and dread. It can become a phobia all based on your individual subjective experiences with that object or, or symbol or, or activity. Okay. I can understand perfectly. I'm, no, not perfectly from your perspective, but I can understand in my own, from my own perception why you, sex has such negative connotations, why you have such you know, horrid associations um, you know, uh, uh, with the activity and, and with the imagery of it and stuff like that. And the solution, the cure for this is to expose yourself to the exact opposite. Not to continue shunning something as if it's, you know, a monolith um, of, of that it's only always going to be this way. That's a psychosis, Chandler. That's a, that's a fixation. You're, you're negatively fixating on something and you're, and you're not – I mean I'm, you're, you're, you're gradually moving away from that now by having this conversation. But what I'm trying to say is in, up until now, you have this negative fixation on it and you have you – have, selectively chosen different components and aspects and, and, you know, and consequences of this activity that reinforces your negative bias concerning it. That is no different than what people do with religion. That's no different than what people do with minorities and other um, human beings who look differently from them, other races, other ethnicities, other sexual orientations, other genders. That's the same exact thing. You have a prejudice a discriminatory outlook, a negative, you know, attitude towards something that that can be absolutely beautiful, that can be uh, transcendent for, for some people. I mean, tantric sex. Look up Eastern traditions and and what what's possible, what it, what's possible to do with breathing techniques and and when you are like a hundred percent in alignment with with the other person. And th th there's just there's this whole other world. There's a whole other universe that you're not seeing. And I, I feel bad. I feel starved. I'm, I'm, I, I am, I am heartbroken for what you've been through and what you've experienced. But I, I'm, I'm even more saddened that like, it's always going to stay that way because of what you've experienced, because of your trauma. And it doesn't have to. What I'm trying to say is, you're living in your own reality. You're living in your own world. You have your, 
your perception, your subjective opinion has shaped and reinforced that same negative experience. That trauma that happened to you was reinforced and reinforced and reinforced because you only saw it in a negative light. And so like anything, once you have a belief system, once you adopt a belief system, remember I'm, I'm using the analogy of religion. It's not even an analogy. It's the truth. Once you have a predetermined belief system, everything you see, your entire worldview is through those glasses. You're like, oh my God, there was a tornado. There was an earthquake. God is angry. Those people must have sinned. Like, oh, why did this happen? Why did this cut me off? What? what? Confirmation bias. Yeah, confirmation bias. Oh my God, why did this bad thing happen to me? I must have done something wrong. God is angry with me. Oh no, it was the devil. It was because I had this, I had this symbol. I had this, this, um, there's a, there's a negative spirit attached to it. I have to throw it away. This must be the reason. Okay. So basically the problem is not your negative beliefs. The problem is that you're not open. You, you, and I'm speaking sort of in past tense, you know, but you've become closed off to anything new that has to do with this subject is what I'm trying to say. So you have a predetermined bias that has like that has like walled you walled you in so that you only perceive this thing from that original negative um you know point of view and what i'm trying to say is what you need to do is the exact opposite you need to explore and and research or expose yourself or embrace like everything else that sex could be you know what sex what sex does what it can do, how it can be abused, how it can be manipulated, how it can be exploited, how it can be glorified. You know all that already. So you're the expert at that, okay? Why don't you start learning and exploring what else it could be? Like all the other things, the entire universe that's there, the entire universe that exists because antimatter and matter clashed and collided and matter won, okay? On a fundamental level, the universe masturbated with itself and <laughs> ejaculated and created the universe. Okay. Well, that's and, and actually, actually, this is what um this is what ancient cultures actually believe. This is what many uh, pagans essentially believe that that the universe and Earth and everything came from the consummation from the copulation of two um of two uh, chthonic gods or 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 two elemental elemental powers that clashed and came together or God cut himself and bled and created or, you know, whatever. But that's, that's why they, they personify it that way because it's actually, it's actually true. If you learn the, 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 um, the seven laws of hermeticism, it's, it's all there, man. Gender polarity. Um, okay. So the point I'm trying to say is I want you to look at the universe and look at biology and look at the human experience and understand that like, Everything operates this way, and it is in no way a bad thing, but it can become a bad thing based on, you know, who's involved and in what context and how it's, how it's used. Anything can be used. Anything can be manipulated. Anything can be turned – anything can be corrupted and turned and turn into something evil and, um, and terrible, and it's, that's, that's the whole point is, is to learn – you know, what goodness is, to learn what consent is, to learn, you know, what it means to mutually respect someone, okay? Like, yeah. like that's the whole point. If there was no such thing as rape, this is going to get me in trouble, but if rape didn't exist, I don't think we would fully understand what consent is. What, what You can't, it's true. You can't have up without down. You can't have black without white. Contrast is necessary to experience anything. And so all the evil and all the pain and all the suffering and all the perversion and all the corruption that you and I know about and that we've seen and experienced, that gives us context. That allows us to envision and imagine a world without those things. Not a world without sex, but a world where sex is no longer misused, where, where rape – doesn't exist where no one forces themselves on anyone where people do not dominate other people and they don't dominate other animals where there's no such thing as artificial insemination and you know, no such thing as abortion because anyone who has a child is going to do it for the right reasons and they're going to be fully mature, financially stable, emotionally, you know, sound. And, and it's going to be 
all done and it's out of love and it's going to be, you know, more, let's not say ideal or, you know, utopia, but let's say more ideal than it is now. We are evolving. We have always been evolving. Everything yeah. will continue to evolve. Like, so, so look at that. Think of it in that way that, that it's wow. a gradual you know, yeah. ascension. So, so like, like, for example, let, let's take, let's take cars as an example. Because what? You know, humans like cars, okay? Like cars. cars, cars. Are, so uh, you're, what you're describing basically is the equivalent of a world where everybody is a safe driver. Everybody follows the rules. Nobody's nobody's texting while driving or drunk driving, for example. Yep. So you're talking about a world where nothing was ever misused because people knew what they were doing and they were responsible. So that's what you're t describing, right? Yeah, and it's not hard to do. In terms of driving, I I got all that figured out. I, I had a whole spiel where I explained how easy it would be to create magnetic barriers so cars don't run into each other, and they're doing it now. I mean, the Tesla Tesla yeah. does this, and Tesla car it has the you know the sensor around it, so, yeah. so it's, it's super it's super easy to create that. It's just nobody thought yeah. thought to like like, like here's a, here's an example imagine if a system was in place similar to uh in, in, in sexuality a similar safeguard were put in place by nature now, i know i'm hypothetical yeah. here okay but no, like, that's like, a good, good thought experiment yeah this is a thought experiment so imagine if rape was impossible for example it was impossible for rape to happen because like let's say that erections didn't happen unless there was true uh, uh, love involved like oh, yeah. you know what I'm so that yeah. nobody if they didn't truly love would be physically capable of engaging in yeah sex. and if they didn't and this gets into like eugenics but and if they and if genetically they weren't like a perfect match and there were like like defects or they were like you know inherited diseases and stuff then they wouldn't be able to reproduce it just they wouldn't be able to have a baby exactly right? so, you know, yeah yeah i could i could play god for a little while go ahead yeah so you see what i'm saying what you and i have just did, through this thought experiment we have already created a world that is better than the one we're living in all right, hold, on, hold on a second hold on it's better it's better you know on a certain level from a certain perspective, from your perspective, it's better. From my perspective, it's better. But from a universal perspective, I believe it's there for a reason. I believe pain and manipulation and exploitation are there so that we can learn to do the opposite. Because if it, if if there wasn't a way, if there wasn't a way to corrupt something, if if every if everything was incorruptible, then what would make it valuable? Why would it? Why would it be even desirable? Why would we want? I mean, altruistic, kind, sensitive, caring, empathetic people. Why would we desire more of that as opposed to what? We would have no. We would have no basis. We'd have no context for what we don't want to be. We ha we have no context for what we want to be unless we saw like what it is. I've had these conversations with Trick. You know, why can't we have a simulation? Why can't we uh, sort of extrapolate and let's say, let's project, okay, this could go wrong. This could happen. Well, this could go, okay, let's em eliminate that because that, if you go down that route, um, I could see how things could get bad and a lot of people could suffer. So let's just figure all this out and plan it all ahead of time so that that doesn't happen, right? Makes sense, right? It makes sense to us, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure how I'm going to explain this to you. But I believe that I can, and I believe that there's an answer to this. So just give me a minute, okay? We're, we're asking like a fundamental question. This goes. This is like us asking whether or not we should have been born. Remember that? Like that, yes. that, that episode, like to be or not to be? Like, and we yes. chose, we said, okay, the same answers that you and I gave on that, that podcast is the same reason that – the corruption of sex exists okay you remember you said you said if i had my choice if it was for me if it was for my sake i would never be i would never be born i would never want to go through all the hell that i've been through i said the same thing i, I would never want to if i had my choice i'd go back in time get my mom and dad and be like don't have a child you don't know what he's going to go through 
a life of, of depression and, and misery and anxiety and intense suffering and turmoil and struggle and hardship. And this actually applies to anyone, you know, don't do it. You're going to regret it. You're going to regret it. Okay. And so we both said for ourselves, um, we would choose to not exist. Right. But we said, but wait a minute, but it's like, but if we can make the world a better place, if we can somehow shine the light, if we can somehow help, you know, mitigate and, and eliminate the, the suffering of animals, if we can educate people, if we can inspire and motivate people to be better than they were than, than, than you know, their previous generations or whatever, if we can do some good in this world, I think you both, we both decided, we both said, you know what, I, I, I'll, I'll choose to be, I'll, 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 I'll bear the cross, I'll, I'll do it. But that's only if we can make a difference. That's only if people listen to us, if we become successful, if our information is shared. In other words, in order for us to live, it is required for us to believe there is a reason that we are here, that we need to be here. Well, not so, not so much a reason, but that, that that some good can come from it. Exactly. That we can, we can actually impact not. the world. That we can right. impact the world in a positive way. And, yeah. and also, and that, there is yeah. something you said that I do agree with, Paul, though. Like, we wouldn't truly know what good is about evil because things are defined by their opposites. And I know this right. to be true, even though I don't like this fact, I know it to be true. And the person who I am, the fact that I am Chastity White Rose, being the vegan virgin, the one who's vowed celibacy for life, the, me becoming this way, whether you agree or disagree with it, um, is because of past suffering, because of what I've seen go wrong with sexuality. Yeah, everything that. about your character is directly traceable in, on a on a causational on yeah. a causal level through cause and effect. Because because of the traumatic, terrible things that have happened to you, you've become the outstanding person of, of character and and morality and altruist you know altruistic. Um, you know, sentiments that you have, you know, you, you are a compassionate, empathetic person because yeah. you have suffered so much. If you did yeah. not suffer, if you literally, literally didn't go through that, you might be an asshole. We might not be friends. Like we might have nothing in common. And literally, I'm not saying it's so great because you know me, I'm just saying like, literally you would be a completely different person. Okay. You would yeah. be spoiled. You would be one of those superficial idiots on TikTok showing off your tits or showing off your whatever, you would be one of those people basically, uh, you know, perpetuating superficiality and, and ex you know, a fixation and obsession with externals and, appear and physical appearance. You would be a shallow, superficial person that I would want to have nothing to do with, okay? And basically, yeah. you would just be contributing to the, uh, you know, the, the, the degradation of, of, of society. So, exactly. So, again. Thing though, but get this now. This this is this is a beautiful thing, okay? This is a beautiful thing because through that suffering, I ended up being a better person. But by being a better person, the idea is that people can see an example of a way to be without having to suffer those same things. That is what I wish. That people can learn to follow an example because uh, a person is a leader, you know, not, not like a cult leader. I'm just saying a leader in that people follow your example. They see the way you live your life and they see the good things you do. And then they, they want to follow your example. And so I, I am who I am because, partly because of suffering that happened to me. You are who you are partly because of suffering that happened to you and good has come out of evil. And that is a beautiful thing. Actually, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it further. There just there would be no good without evil. There there would be no there'd be no context for it. You literally could not have anything good. Everything would. If everything was evil all the time, it wouldn't be evil. It would just be boring. If everything was good all the time, it wouldn't be enjoyable. It would be lame. It would be boring. Like you literally, you, you have to have some form of contrast uh, uh, to create experience. So what you're really the I, I keep, the question we're really asking is is experience itself a good thing or a bad thing? Is is knowledge a good 
good thing or a bad thing? Is self-awareness a good thing or a bad thing? And what I'm trying to say is it obviously must be because the universe in its wisdom chose to exist in this way. Let's just say in this way because I'm having – Another way of saying yeah. this, Papo, yeah. is are we meant – from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Oh, yeah, 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 totally. Great, it's perfect. Uh, that's why it's crazy how Christianity really does, it really it really locks in and it, it like it touches on all the perfect, um, let's just say everything in Christianity is relevant and true on a metaphorical level, you know, on, on a symbolic level. It really, it really does resonate. And it, of course it has to, do because all myths, all legends, all poetry, all allegory, and met, you know, exist for a reason. They're just expressions of of the of, of elements and aspects of existence. They are they they are the the natural world does all these things and and recreates it in in various in various forms, and that's what that's what that's what exists. So I don't want to get too lofty and philosophical but yeah was it better for adam and eve in this mythology in this um scenario was it better for adam and eve to live in, ig in ignorance and in stay in innocence or eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you know and then and lose the gift of eternal life and and basically communion and perfect you know harmony with each other and harmony with the divine and then you know, basically become get expelled and have to suffer and have to experience all this stuff. What's better? Is it better to remain um, innocent and ignorant, or is it better to go through the process, you know, of learning what good and evil is and then choosing to be good? I mean, that's the question of the ages. This is what all uh, philosophers have have asked themselves, you know, since the beginning of time or the beginning of you know recorded um, history of society. Um, so is it, so is it an open-ended question or do you think you have the answer? Because I, I keep thinking, I want to, I want to say something about, about how to actually cope with suffering and, and a possible way, and a, a possible way for you to transcend these, all of these negative uh, feelings associated with this. Um, so, so is it an open-ended question or do you, do you think you have the answer? Well, I would have to say that um, it's not—it's not to be or not to be. It's to to be good or not to be good. It's to be able to think or not think. It's to be self-aware yes. or, or or live in pure ignorance. What's See, better? Here's the thing: is that a person could be stay in ignorance and be wrong, but not know it. Right. And that would be right. worse. That would be worse because they could not change if they had no awareness, if they were not able to think for themselves. And so I think maybe the answer is yes, we are meant to be from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because otherwise, how do we know if we're right or wrong? How do we know if we're good or bad? Well, let's, maybe let's put it on a biological level because I relate everything to biology, right? Is pain a good thing or a bad thing? It's that simple. That's what we're talking about. You know, we really want to reduce it down, break it down to the fundamental, um, the core question here is pain, good or bad. I know that there is a disease and I forgot what it's called where people don't actually feel pain and they will bump their arms and they'll cut themselves. And sometimes they'll get lacerations or wounds that they don't even know about. They'll have infections and things because they have no sensory um, connection to that, uh, uh, to that, to that injury okay you can look it up i'm not sure what it's called so their nerve endings they feel the sensation of touch you know of touch and they can grab and pick up objects and, and navigate through life but they don't actually have their pain receptors have been cut off and they're not sending the signal to their brain and it's actually extremely dangerous like they have to basically you know be cared for because they could so easily harm themselves because pain is good in most humans because it protects you from, from harm. It ca it causes you to um. Can you hear this background noise? By the way, I have a video on. I was getting too loud for me. Okay, 
uh, pain. Is, is pain a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, it just all depends. Well, too much, too much pain, too much pain, or or let's like constant, intensive, um, unjust pain inflicted on another organism. Of course, is 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 wrong. But yeah. but pain uh, is what is what keeps you from putting your hand on the fire. It's what it's what keeps you from it's what keeps your body safe. Pain allows you to value your physical your physical form. It, it allows you to, so, to, to care for your body. So, 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 there, there, so there is pain that does serve a purpose, but unfortunately the pain that, for example, humans are inflicting on these other animals, that pain doesn't serve any purpose because those animals can't get away from those humans. And that Absolutely. pain is all those humans. Uh, I, hate, I hate saying this, but the roundabout, the roundabout eventual purpose that it serves is for is to is for us to evolve. It, it allows us to rise above being abusive toward uh, those who are less uh, those who are less intelligent or or or, or less powerful um, and capable than us. It allows us to learn, you know, what it means to be gods, to be the gods of the animals. It, it allows us to learn what it means to. That we don't lord our lord it over them, the power and do, to dominate them, but we treat them with mercy and kindness and respect, and and, right. and so there would be yeah. no there would be no respect, there would be no mercy if there was no tyranny, yeah. there would be there would be no justice if there was no injustice, there would be no pleasure without pain. Yes, and so th this allows us to evolve, but what do those animals get out of it? What reward do they have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I. I See, that's that's we're falling into the trap that theists fall into. Okay, we're yeah. falling into the trap that um that, that traditional religions fall into because, okay, this is this might be difficult for me to explain. We are we are doing the same thing that you that I was just accusing you of doing, or that I pointed out my observation that that you were um that you were doing. We are isolating. A, a cause and effect scenario and trying to inject meaning in the, in the specific consequences of one situation. I have never said that all things happen for a good reason, but all things happen for ultimately a reason. So the bad, the bad things that happen to countless animals, okay, even the bad things they do to each other, and actually this is the point I wanted to get back to. Remind me of this: um, the bad things they do to each other, and the bad things we do to them, serve a purpose in the future, so that evolved human beings can remember and say, "We will never do that again. We will never be like that. We must protect all life. We are the stewards of the earth. We we have to remain." Um, you know, uh, uh, disciplined and 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 learn what it means to, to rule uh, with with kindness, to rule with dignity and compassion, and treat the other as we treat ourselves. So, the, the there is a purpose to it, but but the problem is we're stopping at at the at the consequence. We're stopping and we're fixating on the causal chain of events to a certain point. And we're not, we're not allowing that that causal chain of events to, to unfold and play out and play out and play out to the future. There will be a purpose for all of this. I'm telling you, Chandler, the last few weeks, okay, I'm not going to get into too much detail about this because it's very personal. All right. Everything I hated about myself, everything. I mean, my thinning hair, my scars, um, my if I if I feel chubby, whatever. Like everything that I hated about about this physical form, about this body. Everything that I hated about other people in my life. Everything that I hated about my life. Those became the most beautiful and and coveted aspects of my of my memories of my existence those were the things that 
anchored me to this to this form to this body those are the things that kept me from going insane that that allowed me to return to myself let's just say all the things that i hated before i now understand the value of and i can appreciate and it has a completely different meaning now and i and through that i learned to love and accept myself on a level that I wish other people could experience that I've never experienced before. Um, it's real. It's real simple. Look at it this way, okay? If you have a, a pet, a companion animal, okay? My cat is a little asshole. He beats up the other cat. He chases her around. He's such a jerk. He's got so many flaws, but he's beautiful. He's absolutely beautiful and perfect, just the way he is. I mean, I wish he would change for the sake of the other cat, because he harasses her and you know chases her around. But like I'm saying. Everything about him that's imperfect, I love because I look at him the way God sees us. And you know what I mean when I say God? I mean us in the future. Nature in the future looks back at us, looks down at us, looks at us with so much love and so much I, – I, I can't explain it. It's the imperfections and it's the, the failures and it's the weakness that makes us, makes us so – beautiful and cherished and valuable in the eyes of divinity. And so in its own wisdom, and trust me, it's hard for me to say this, but I think I do have an answer now to it. In its own wisdom, nature, God, omnia, knows that all of this is exactly what needs to happen in order for it to evolve and become a good, benevolent God, a wise, all-knowing, all-powerful, you know, all, all, you know, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, omnibenevolent, eternal, immortal being. If you want God to be good, if you want nature and existence to be just, and you want things uh, to level out, and, and 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 you want homeostasis, like this process is necessary. And what I'm trying to tell you, Chandler, nobody's going to believe me. You're not going to believe me now. I don't even believe myself sometimes. What I'm trying to tell you is all of this is just – it's just a rough draft. It's just, it's just a trial run. All of this, everything that we're experiencing, everything we've ever experienced is a thought exercise in the mind of God. Literally following every scenario, every possible scenario, just like you and I were doing a little while ago, every possible scenario to its conclusion. It is a thought experiment. It is not real. It is an illusion. We are literally the mind of God imagining all possible potential outcomes, all potentialities, so that it can finally zero – so it can zero in on what it should be, on how things should be. The problem is – God, God creates. It can't help but create. That's what it does. It creates instantly. That's its nature. That's all it does. Okay? So the problem is its own creations are experiencing the scenarios that God is imagining. You are trapped in the dreams, the daydreams or the nightmares of God. You are the good guy. Or is it the nice guy? The Ryan Reynolds film that's coming out soon, where he's he's actually in a video game. Okay, you are trapped in a possible scenario of the way life could be that God is imagining and and acting out and living out to its con to its completion to its conclusion, so that it can learn how not to be, what what not to create, like the direction that it should go in. See. No one gets this, but God is not all good, but God is perfect because – I can't believe I'm quoting Peter. Perfection is the enemy of the good because if it were perfect, it wouldn't – if it, if things were perfect according to us, it wouldn't know the difference. It wouldn't be perfect. Things would be suffering. Things would be suffering in a different way. Like it needs to suffer in this way in order to learn that suffering is bad, okay?
That's literally what it comes down to. And what I'm proposing, what I'm trying to tell you is there is a way for you to overcome your awareness of your own suffering, your negative association with it, and your, your awareness of the pain and misery and anguish of others, especially non-human animals. There is a way to transcend that, not by blinding yourself to it and not caring and like closing your eyes and pretending it's going to go away, but by understanding it, by fully and completely understanding why it's happening this way, what it's there for, and what it really is, like what it actually is. When you yeah. understand – yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. see, it, here's, it's very interesting because this is a very strange concept because in most religions there is the belief, at least that they want to believe, that, that God is all good. And I think the one of the biggest struggles for a pantheist or a biopantheist is we have to deal with this reality that God is not all good, you know, and that and that truth is what it is, whether good or bad. And that's that's a that's a hard pill to swallow. It really There's two is. ways of looking at it. There's two ways of looking at it. It's that God is all good in the future. It will become such because of everything we're experiencing right now. And the other way of looking at it is everything is absolutely perfect. Everything is absolutely exactly what it should be because life is but a dream. Once you understand that those individual beings are not suffering themselves, that it's actually God in every single body, in every single creature on earth, and every single organism in all the galaxies of the entire universe that was imagined by God, it's God acting out and suffering and experiencing all of that so that it can identify with its own creation, so that it can so that it can be a good God, so that it so that it doesn't just create things and then forget about it. It's actually the one experiencing it. You can't blame God when God is the one that's actually suffering. The core foundational belief or awareness of pantheism and of biopan is that there is no separation between creator and creation and we are actually one and the same the core fundamental awareness is that god is all things that you and i are god and like what i'm trying to tell you is if you want to transcend this hyper awareness of suffering that you and i both have and especially vegans and stuff or people who've been molested or abused horribly, I think you got to come to a place. I, I think I know what the answer is, but I don't know how to convince anybody of it. The best way I can describe it is you're going to wake up and realize that this was all just a dream. It was just a nightmare. When you wake up from a nightmare, you're like, holy shit, that was intense. Wow, like so and so died. I was being chased by zombies. And like, man, I was so stressful. God, okay, whew, I'm so glad I'm back in reality now. I'm so glad none of that was real, okay? And that's exactly what God is doing right now. God. Oh, thank you. I'm going to have nightmares of dying in a chocolate factory. <laughs> <laughs> what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is we are the dreams and the nightmares of God, of the creator. The creator is, is perpetually – thinking and experiencing those thoughts in a tangible way. And, and what I'm trying to say is there is one consciousness that, that permeates all, and that consciousness is the one experiencing each and everything. It's just, it's just not aware. It's, it's gotten so good at playing the part. It's gotten so good at, at, at playing the, all these different characters – that like it, it convinces itself that it's real. You just said, but that's the you know the reality. That's the world we live in. And what I'm trying to say is, I don't think it is anymore. I'm trying to tell you, I don't think the world is real. I think the world is are the is the imagination of God, like pretending to be all these things so that it can have a full, visceral, tangible experience of it. That this is actually only one purpose, one part of it, so that it can actually 
transcend those things and create and create a real universe that doesn't that doesn't have all this pain and suffering and is and is more more finely tuned or more uh, efficient or more egalitarian is that the right word that there's more equanimity yeah. There's here's, more, here's, here's um, a thought. Here's a thought. Paul. More quality. Here's a thought because I, you know, I've seen the Matrix movies and I've thought about this question of solipsisms and all kinds of all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I thought about this. I thought about this idea that in this world, when we die, we merely exit the Matrix, then we wake up in another world. What, what I, yeah, go ahead. I got to thinking about it, and I think, wait a minute, what if? The world where I'm talking to honesty with uniform is not the dream, but this is the dream. You got and it. You got it. You got that it. World. That's it. And you know why? Because you use your imagination to create that potential scenario where everything was ideal and you could speak to yourself and you could you could basically communicate your own wisdom to yourself in order to help this avatar. That you're in right now in order to help and heal and and um and comfort the the form that you're in right now and i did the exact same thing with the portal okay yeah. and what i'm trying to tell you is yes it's the ultimate form of solipsism it's it's called it's a form of monism called idealism which i always rejected i'm like the, of course reality of course this is an illusion this is a material world we're here we we feel, you know, but you know what? Do you ever play Sims? You play no, Minecraft. No, no, no. Well, okay, you ever play a video game? Any video game that has a, like a first-person shooter or, or a character? Or a game? Think about it for a moment. Just think about it for a moment. I don't know how to say this. Be nice to your, to your game characters because those characters believe that they're real. That's all they know. That's all they experience. That's what they are. That's why that movie is coming out now. That's why it's been delayed and it's coming out now. That's why WandaVision j just just happened. God is reminding us at all times of, of who and what we really are, of what we of what it is. Like we're we're living in a dream, man. And I'm not saying kill yourself so you can wake up. I mean, if you do, then you'll just you'll just transition into another form. What I'm saying, I'm saying I'm saying it's one consciousness that has forgot that has gotten so that has gotten so caught up in the game that it's playing that it that it literally it convinced itself God has amnesia. It's forgotten who and what it is. Well, for people, for, I'm saying for the majority of the population, those constituent parts of God, those those manifestations of God, have forgotten. They think that they're human. They've forgotten that they're, that they're really the creator, and they they God has become so immersed and engrossed in the pain and the struggle and the adventure and the tragedy and the drama and the beauty and the love and the and the, the struggle. I experienced this literally, Chandler Chastity. I'm telling you, I experienced this. I experienced this on a tangible level. I I got caught up. In, in, in imagining various scenarios, like to answer the existential questions of where we came from, why are we here, how should we live our lives, what happens after we die, what are we, what is God, I, I literally, I, I literally perceived multiple realities, alternate realities, and each time I started to think, oh, that's what's really happening, that's what's going on, that's what it is. Holy shit, if my reality did not reinforce that and confirm it and confirm it. And I was like, this is this is real. This is what's really going on. And each time, but this is this is the, the brilliant, the, the miracle of it. When I shifted to another worldview, then that worldview was then reinforced. And I was like, wait a minute, something this is this can't be they can't all be true unless unless I'm the one telling the story. Holy shit, this is a choose your own adventure. I'm writing the book. I'm the author. I'm the artist. I'm the sculptor. I'm the creator. I'm the one imagining all these alternate realities. I'm the one imagining this reality. And I said, I, 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 it transcended, I transcended it, and I said, I keep getting caught up. Every time I think I'm every time I think something is real, then my reality, like, 
like reinforces it and and lies to me. I lie to myself. I keep telling myself that this is what it is. And then when I shift, how is it possible that when it shifts, then that reality becomes true? The only being in existence that has that power is 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 the omnia, is is the creator, is God. And and so the power of imagination and simultaneously perception is the ultimate power. Whatever you perceive to be true, that is what defines your reality. That's why you think that sex is evil and corrupt and bad because that's what happened to you. And so you were lied to by your own experience and it, and it corrupted that experience for you and, and essentially convinced you of something that's not true because it was true for the moment. It was absolutely true for the moment. What you experienced was real to you. And so it tainted your view, your vision of sex forever. And what I'm trying to say is that's the same scenario with every ounce of pain and loss and anxiety and and fear and stress that we undergo it's it's literally god like convincing itself that it's immortal that it's a human being that it's a grasshopper that it's a cow that it's a pig that it's chandler that it's that thing and that's why it feels that and that's why it suffers that so the goal for all beings all conscious beings or let's say on an intellectual level the highest the highest evolved being in terms of consciousness on this planet would be dolphins and whales, cetaceans. I'll probably put them first. And then humans, right? Primates and cetaceans are the highest evolved, intellectually speaking, um, organism on this planet. So the, the goal should be for all of us to wake up, for us to literally wake up and, and realize that we are the ones inventing this reality, creating this reality. Why do you think everyone's at odds with everyone else? Why is everyone fighting? Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, you know, anti-maskers, Trump supporters, Biden supporters, religious fanatics, religious extremists, atheists, pantheists, um, pagans, Wiccans, they don't fight that much, but basically, like, why is everybody at odds with everybody? Family members, the older generations, the boomers, the millenniums, because everyone is living in their own universe. Every single individual, every single organism, okay, every single organism that is experiencing existence is is experiencing their own perception, their own version of it, and it's at odds with the other versions of it. And so we're all at war, and we're always going to be until we all wake up, until the conscious the, the, the conscious beings on this planet that we can communicate with actually wake up and say, we're the ones creating all of this. We're in charge. If we think it, it becomes so. It just takes yeah. a longer time. Yeah, well, you know, here's the, here's the thing, Paco, yeah. is I know that we are in, in our, our own reality, and that's what's interesting. And yet at the same time, there are these times, these moments, when we are sharing an object of reality at the same time. The very fact that you and I are talking, we're, diff we're different parts of the universe. We're different enough, and we know... We we're able to share our experiences, and I'm talking about my reality, you're talking about your reality, and so we are in a shared time of reality. We're in, you know, magic hour, as it would be called in that movie, Your Name, for example, where, where people temporarily step outside their own world, and they realize that there are other worlds. This is... Another, another, analogy, another analogy we could use is, we're the genie in the bottle. A genie, a gin in ancient pre-Islamic or Islamic folklore um, and tradition is one of the most one of the most powerful beings in existence, okay? A, a jinn can do anything except it's a prisoner. It's trapped in a bottle. It's trapped in prison, okay? But it can, you, you know, it grants wishes. Um, it's obliged to grant people wishes, but it can literally do anything except be free. It can do anything except realize that it's not a slave. And that's its power and that's its weakness, right? What I'm trying to say is there's one genie and the prison is the is the belief that we're not the all-powerful jinn. That this jinn can do anything. And the, the only problem is it, it's it's trapped. It won't it doesn't see its own power. It's not waking up. It needs to wake up and see it doesn't have any shackles. I forgot the cartoon, Aladdin. You know, the Aladdin. shackles, he gives him that at the end. He gives him the gift, and he frees him. That was his final wish. He lets him, he says, I want you to be free. I don't want you to be a slave to anyone else. And he flies off, you know, Robin Williams. It's a beautiful yeah. moment. It's just like, 
that is what needs to happen is that the all-powerful jinn, the all-powerful God, creator divinity, needs to wake up and realize like it's dreaming. This is just a nightmare. It needs to wake itself up and make things better based on this imaginary scenario that it acted out. And it kind of goes back and forth because what I'm trying to say is its own thoughts have taken on a life of its own. We are the thoughts of God. We are the ones experiencing it. Just like Ready Player One, just like The Matrix, just like all all these films, The Truman Show, there's just so many yes. that, are, that are telling this message that literally we have to break out of it. We have to wake up. We have to realize, take back our power. And I, I mean, these are just words. I'm explaining it on, a, on an intellectual level and you're hearing the semantics and the thoughts and ideas. What I'm trying to tell you is I literally experienced this. I, this was my perception for weeks and weeks at a time. Okay. I'm not, I didn't think this way before this experience. I thought differently. I thought reality was real. I thought there was objective reality. There was science. There was, you know, logic and reason. And, and, but I, I now believe and I, I truly believe that, that reality itself is malleable and it's no different than a computer program. And that was the revelation I had yesterday morning when I woke up. Oh, this is going to be hard to explain. Was that I was, I was, is that every time we open our, every, every time we slip into another state of consciousness, like we fall asleep or we wake up we are actually literally recreated. The simulation is recreated and we're a little bit ahead in, in, in time and, we, and we've forgotten a little bit of what our, of what our program or the construct looked like. And so we age a little bit, a little bit more each time. And th there was this whole thing that went along with it. But what I'm trying to say is it sounds insane. I know how insane it sounds. It sounds crazy. But if you really want me to communicate this to you, either tonight or tomorrow, I can. And whether I convince you or not, you, you'll see, you'll see, um, I'll be able to explain this a lot better. Let's put it that way. So do you want to wrap this up for tonight? And, and yeah, I think we've been going for over two hours. I think we do yeah. need to wrap this up for tonight. But also, um, I want to, I would, do want to ask you a question too, because something I do want to mention is that, um, see, some people think that I just had traumatic experiences in my childhood, and then I just, uh, just, just decided, oh, I'm asexual, I'm going to be celibate. I think that's what people think. They think it was that simple. I said some people think it was that simple. It was actually a little bit longer and more complex than that. And I had a phase where I was trying to explore my sexuality. I was trying uh, all kinds of things, and I had and I had the power of the internet uh, behind me, which could be a very dangerous place. Sure. So I just want to say that there was a there was a time, and I and I tried some experiments, and I. I, I, you might be able to talk about that next time. Hey, with yourself or, or with another person? With, with myself, always myself. You know, you know, being being the introverted autistic person I am, that's just it. Is that every every uh, thing I tried were all masturbatory. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. And I and I tried I, I tried many many things and. We don't, we don't have to get too, we don't have to get yeah. too graphic. We don't, we don't, yeah, we don't have to get too graphic. You're saying it didn't yeah. happen overnight. I, mean, I never thought that. I always knew it was a whole combination. Why? Of things. I, 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 I just want to clarify that to yeah. people. You know I knew that was. I want to clarify that to people. And 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 you know, look, and I I I'm I'm totally comfortable talking about that too. We don't have to do that right now well, anyway. Well, I am too, uh, but juxtaposed with everything else we've been talking about, it might not be such a good it's, idea. Yeah, it's a because, of, because of the perception of others and, and how it might be because of their own hangups, you know, because yeah. of their own, um, you know, right. whatever. So yeah. but, it's, yeah. it's their, it's their re, um, receptiveness that, that might be compromised. Yeah, so. exactly. But I just, I just wanted to clarify that though, because some people have this mistaken notion you know, well, you know, how do you know you, you don't like something unless you try it, you know? Yeah. And there's, and there's, there's a certain, 
thing like that's a legitimate question, but there's a no, lot I've, more I've always known no, I've always known it was a whole combination. It was the things that happened to you, it was things you did, it was things you tried, it was things you saw, it was things you read. And I, I understand the very logical, ethical reasons behind it, you know, the association yeah. with, with human reproduction and procreation and, and rape and abortion. Um, you know, and I, I totally get that. Like, I understand it. There, there, there's enough in there's there's enough in life in reality to basically reinforce or deconstruct any belief system, any belief system you have. I could say skin is bad. I hate skin. I feel so much pain. I want to get rid of my skin, so I'm going to support transhumanism, and I'm going to get an exoskeleton of metal and steel, and uh, you know, and because skin is a bad thing. Look, all the pain. All the suffering in the world it comes from having skin let's just get rid of skin let's right. become let's become uh you know fiberglass or, or or silicon uh constructs and then we'll be protected and we'll never have to feel pain ever again and we can just program ourselves to experience it you know uh mentally like set off the the, the neural receptors of dopamine and serotonin and stuff we don't need to feel anything let's stop let's stop having nerve endings see yeah I could do anything. So yeah. I, if I go down this rabbit hole, I could say, yeah. no, Chandler, Chandler, it's not sex. It's nerve endings. It's having nerves. It's having uh, it's having um, arteries and blood vessels and, uh, you know, the, sending electrical impulses and signals uh, to the brain. Let's cut that off. We can fix that. We can make our skin tough and we can take away the sensation of pain. And that's the real enemy. The real enemy is having nerves and nerve endings. See? And I could I could develop a whole campaign based on it and be like, you guys just don't understand. We gotta get rid of our nerves. If we get rid of our of our of our sensory organs, then we'll, we'll nobody will suffer anymore. It'll be an ideal world. Same thing. Well, yeah, but yeah, so you know, but surely you can see Popo, and surely anyone who's actually listened to this whole thing can understand why I asked to talk about this topic with you. Because look what it's led to. Look, we've had the most. Well, that's just because that's just because it's you and me. I don't. I, I, I actually, and I don't think I'm being prideful by saying this. I don't. I'm not sure that any that I, just your average person could talk about these subjects and go to the places that you and I go. That it's just exactly. It's, it's, it's look, it, it, it is because you and I are accustomed to going deep. That's what we do to to deeply question reality. That's what people like you and I do best. And it's and I I think it's been great uh, hashing this out with you and talking about what reality is, what God is, what is sexuality, what is good or evil. How can we know good without evil? All these topics. This is what religion deals with, but it doesn't deal with it enough. Instead, it just provides answers that are really not answers. It and, doesn't deal with it in an honest and authentic way. It just yeah. keeps re repeating the same answers and the same definitions over and over. Exactly. Okay. So that we, we don't have the answers and we have to admit that, but we, you know, nobody does. The, the questioning goes on and on. It never ends. And this, this uh, is like a, this reality is like a computer program, the simulation, the code is being changed. It's being yep. compiled and run and variables change. It, oh, it, absolutely. It, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can call it, you can call it DNA, you know, all the junk DNA, the supposed junk DNA that's in us. Why do you think that's there? It's so that we can literally evolve and adapt over time and become a completely different organism. Like, yeah. That, yeah. we're not, I didn't explain this properly, but I'll try to say it really quickly. I know that this stuff doesn't make sense to the logical mind, but remember, we're talking about the, the notion of time here. Someone had to think up, think up an idea and imagine something, and then years and years and years of trial and error and then they find the tools and they and they bring together the technology and then they create it now if you now since it's since time is relative you just speed up time god had an idea and then he made it happen boom to to him or it or her or whatever like it um it conceptualizes something and then it brings it into fruition but to the but but to for those who are experiencing uh, that manifestation if you want to call it it might take hundred years it might take thousand years but you know there's no there's no concept of time to an immortal being so wow. essentially someone somewhere thought of something and that was the thought and the idea of God and then other people 
brought it together and other people came together and then they coordinated and they collaborated and there was cooperation and they found the materials and they and they um they, they created a blueprint and they put and they they built it and they constructed it and now we use it and it's like the internet or, or you know technology but let me just tell you what just happened i had a thought send a signal through my body got all the you know all the proper components together everyone coalesced and it went into my arm into my hand and you know it it, it did something i'm trying to think of a of something that it a butterfly like i had the thought i'm going to make my hands into a butterfly and that neural impulse went down through my arms and back again and there's this whole relay process and it's if you were if you were the size of a of a microbe and you were watching this process take place, it would probably take a thousand years. It would take forever, right? But to us, it's like, I just made a butterfly with my hands. I thought of it and I just did it, right? But to the to the components, to the microscopic organisms and the all the biological systems and components that were involved in that in that process that's so simple to us, it would be so complex. It would take a thousand years. Are we ever gonna be able to do it? Are we ever gonna be able to do it? Finally, oh, we did it, okay. So I'm talking about the nature of time. So the, what we're talking about, like the world evolving to become a vegan world, to end the animal animal oppression, to end animal enslavement, um, to, to do away with rape and violence and murder and greed and, you know, uh, just all of it. Like it's taking, it seems like it's taking so long for us. Yeah. That's what we're in it. But for the creator, for the being that's doing it, it might have just been like, an hour and then it's done and it's we're, it's already there it's just that we're trapped in time experiencing it because we're like finite beings we only live you know 70 to 100 years that's nothing in the age of the universe the universe is 14 billion years old you can't even comprehend that okay how old are you you're in your 30s i'm in my 40s like like 14 yeah. billion years so time to the universe it's all it's all relative to us it's taking forever but what i'm trying to say is it's because we're we're moving so much slower than you know think about the stars that we see they're already dead they, they've burned themselves out they're killer corpses and we're seeing light that's taking that long to reach us for for you know for um stellar bodies from these giant um you know uh hydrogen and helium uh, balls of fire that no longer exist and it's just now reaching us. So what does that mean? Distance. You see what I'm saying? Distance is relative to, to time. Like the, the closer something is, the, the faster, you know, the further away it is, longer it takes to, to get you. So those, those stars don't exist anymore. So this is a whole other su subject. What I'm trying to say is it's a bitch being stuck in time. It sucks being finite. Entropy is, is a terrible... For us, entropy sucks, um, and 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 you know everything dies and fades, and we lose loved ones, and we suffer, and we get hurt, and all these things happen. But what I'm trying to say is, to an infinite being, you know, it's just a blip, and and it sucks. It's like, well, fuck God, why why is it got to do that to us? You know what I'm saying? And so, just treat your computer programs well, because one day those computer programs may become sentient. Okay. They may become AI. They may become the next, the next living organism, conscious, sentient being like us. So, so it's the lesson is to treat all life forms, all forms of life, the the, the animals, lower life forms, insects, you know, other humans, like everyone with love and respect and decency and kindness, because self awareness, you know, is happening everywhere at, at all times, and so. It's not just us that's that's conscious. I'm saying everything is is alive and everything is developing consciousness in its own time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, come on, dude. This is like the great. This is like the greatest podcast ever. Like seriously, <laughs> uh, I, I see it, man. We've talked about so many cool things. It's just I'm me sure. and you. You know, this is what we do. I, if you well, know how painful well, this is for me, I'm, I'm literally anybody, anybody listening to uh, this, you guys have no idea the conversations we have privately on the phone. Like this is this is only a, this is a drop in the ocean. Like I just gotta I just gotta figure out my uh, 
this this setup because I'm I'm literally I'm kneeling down. I'm on my knees. Like I'm I'm literally on my knees on the carpet, and it's so painful. I just I gotta get a chair. I need a chair so yeah, bad. Well, you know, we need to end this broadcast anyway, dude. You know, yeah. it's gotten too long. But thank thanks for thanks for taking your time, man. To sure, for listening sure. to me, it's it's been great. It really has. Uh, do you? I mean, do you feel better? Do you, you feel it was a positive experience? Like, uh, how how's your emotional state? I know you're dealing with a lot with work and everything. Yeah, I'm I'm dealing with a lot of stress right now. But you know, I really. I feel like what I need is I need time to talk about these these questions. I like thinking about these topics. Sure. I don't, I, I don't I don't like not being able to explore, not being able to question. And I feel that's what I what I hated about about Christianity was that you're shut down if you question things, you know? And that's no. why I want to I want to have the freedom to explore and ask these questions. No a lot and, of questions, you know, they stifle, you know, you can't can't question their authority. Um, I mean, I get it. I, I, I get it. I get what they're trying to do, but I mean, it's also not a monolith. There's so many different versions of Christianity. There's so many denominations. I mean, we're literally talking about one interpretation, you know, one mainstream version of it. So there's, there's Christian yeah. mysticism. There's, there's different interpretations of Christianity. You know, there's Gnostic Christians. So yeah. And, and, and also it comes into other things. Like if you, if you question mainstream media or the government, then people call you conspiracy theorists too. You know, if you, if you have any beliefs or you have any questions where you, you doubt what people are being told mainstream, then yeah, people just think you're let's, crazy. Let's, let's address the, on the next podcast, the next show, let's address the nature of belief, the nature of perception. I think that's, this is like literally the, the most important thing. The nature of perception and conflicting belief systems, like essentially, why is how could how could two people look at the same event or the same circumstance and have completely contradictory opposite ideas about it? It's like we're living in different realities, and I'm here to tell you, I think we are. I think we literally are all living yeah. in different, different overlapping realities. It's a multiverse, man. I think we're literally like experiencing like with feedback loops with reinforcement our uh, our perception and our reaction and our interaction with the realities that we're creating creates just chaos all this conflict because no one no one's in agreement about anything because no one's perception is the same if we all yeah. have the same perception or at least one unifying perception I think things could change for the better. So, I don't know. Yeah. 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 There's, there's always more to talk about. It never ends. It's, it's infinity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's, let's wrap it up. And then um, when you stop the recording, I want to ask you some questions about, you know, the next time, um, next time we do this. Okay. Yeah. We'll stop the recording. So I guess we'll say goodbye to everybody for now. that listen to us. You know, Stay, stay tuned for a part two and a part three, hopefully. We'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll talk about more topics. So good night, everybody. Take care.